Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning, bonjour. Très ravi. We have the pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you for coming, waking up early. This is a, a, an early workshop which will talk about the Global Health NDTP3 joint undertaking, presenting the new program and its opportunities for collaboration. By collaboration, we mean everyone. Those who want to collaborate for, to do research, those who want to collaborate to co-fund things, or those who want to collaborate to help us achieve what we want to achieve. The start of this workshop will be a small Q&A, not a Q&A, but a poll, which I will let my colleague Julia introduce the way we'll handle it. Thanks, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Can I just get a show of hands um, in the room for how many people have downloaded the app? Amazing. Then we're going through with the app. So <laughs> if you would have said, you know, no one, then I would have obviously not done this. Um, so the question to the audience, just to get started with the discussion while we wait for other people to join, is what is your field of expertise? Um, and it'd be great if you could all reply via the poll um, that is under the app. Um, and then if the colleagues at the control room could show the word cloud, that would be great. So in the app, you need to go through to the session and the workshop session. And then in the workshop session, there is different options. And there's one called poll, P-O-L-L. And you click, and you should be able to answer to the question. Um, any chance we can make the word cloud bigger? Or is it a no? No? Keep going. OK. So um, unfortunately, I cannot read from here. Um, so <laughs> OK, let's just leave the poll for today and keep moving. Um, but for everyone else, um, the Q&A session will start in 25 minutes. And the aim is to also do it through the app, so through the live Q&A session. So we're hoping that that will work in a couple of minutes. Thank you. OK, I'll proceed, and we'll see how the Q&A will go further uh, with the app. As you all know, the name of the app is the EDTP forum. If you download it, it's called the event. It has the agenda. It has a lot of description of the forum. And you will find where you can do the But maybe later we'll show after we go through this. I'll the Q&A, and it will show you how to do it. The Global Health DCP3 joint undertaking was created in the frame of the EU comprehensive strategy within Africa and, U and SDGs. That was when it was not yet joint undertaking the day the EDSP1, what we refer to as EDSP1 was created. Now what, is, what we are building now is on the success of EDSP1 and 2. So we'll be talking about EDSP3, but sometimes we'll be referring to it, to it as the GH Global Health DCP3 or the joint undertaking. Uh, but for now, let me just try to be using EDSP3, the shortest version. So the EDSP3 novelties include EDSP program being implemented by a new organization, which is no longer in The Hague, but in Brussels. And in that organization, the EU is represented by the Commission, and the participating states, both from Africa and Europe, are represented by the EDSP Association, which most of you know as the one which was implementing the EDSP2. And we do have those two as the founding members of the joint undertaking. <clears throat> the, objectives, the objectives in general are to reduce the socioeconomic burden of infectious disease in sub-Saharan Africa by promoting the development and uptake of new or improved health te technologies, and also to increase health security in sub-Saharan Africa and globally by strengthening the research and innovation-based capacities for preparedness and response to control infectious diseases. Most of you were used under EDTP1 to those three, the big three, HIV, TB, and malaria. When we moved to EDTP2, we had to include NIDs, diarrhea disease, lower respiratory tract infections, and emerging diseases affecting Sub-Saharan Africa. But at this time, from day one, we've also included antimicrobial resistance, climate crisis provoked changes in infectious diseases incidents, but also co-infections and comorbidities, which sometimes were not clearly defined in the programs that we've been running previously. We've put this a small list of NIDs that we cover just to mention that some of those that are listed by the WHO as NIDs are not necessarily in our scope. We've tried to limit this 
to a certain to a shorter list based for the, for two reasons for budget reasons but also looking at what is relevant for sub-Saharan Africa. The partners and contribu contributions to this program are defined as, as, as displayed here, but this is maybe a short version of what is easy to understand as a starting organization. We do have, as I mentioned, the European Commission and the association representing those two <coughs> founding members. So those are the two main contributors, but to also accept or welcome or would like to have an increased uh, contribution from other partners who, are, who come in on ad hoc basis contribute to specific calls or projects. These include industry, philanthropies, or other third countries which are not necessarily in that geographical area from which uh, we have the pool of countries contribute to the program. Now these contributions, as you will see, uh, there's a basis of 8 point, 0 0.8 billion, which comes from the European Union, we are the commission. There is a 0 0.43 billion from the ETSP Association, which is now a large pool of more than 40 countries. And then we do expect at least 0 0.4 billion from the third parties, the, 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 the contributing partners, which include here as examples philanthropies and industry. And in the end, we hope to build a program which will be at least 1.6 billion. My feeling or my hope is that this budget that we think will be at least 1.6 will be much higher. This is a picture which shows who are the partners, the governance structures of this program. It's a, it's a bit different from what we used two in the pre two previous programs, but for as it includes a few legal changes here, I'll invite my colleague Laurent to come present a bit on this. Good morning, everyone. So yes, about this new governance. Uh, in the past, it was all in the uh, in the association, and uh, you had uh, different states represented there that were basically taking decisions. Um, and the European Commission was an observer in the organization. Now the Commission is part of it, and we have a governing board that takes decisions. Where you have the Commission and the. Julien, ah, super. Tu peux allumer. J'ai pas. J'ai pas eu le temps. En fait. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, sorry. Okay, so the, now we have a uh, yeah, decision-making body, the governing board uh, with the DCTP Association and the European Commission taking decisions, and a couple of advisory bodies. In the past, you already had a, a, a scientific committee uh, in the DCTP Association. We still have this, and now we added a stake. Well, a stakeholders group has been added um, to to the picture, and uh, this gives us like a broader set of advice uh, to to take into account for the work program and other other aspects. Uh, we also have an executive director, of course, uh, that will uh, be soon a new one with Michael Makanga. That, so this is something you already know. So this is how it works in terms of decision making. And on top of it, you can see the so-called contributing partners, we'll come back to this very soon, who also uh, are not in the governance per se, but who can have a say about the way we use their contributions, if any. So when it comes to the, the proposals, uh, when you want to, to apply for funding to us, there are a few requirements. Uh, we, don't, we will not go into all details, of course, this morning. You will find them in our work programs. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, yeah, there are different uh, elements to take into account, uh, eligibility for funding, uh, consortium composition, the, the new figure of scientific project leadership. No, not at all. It's a it's a Okay. <laughs> no hard feelings about this. Um, and an affordable access uh, clause uh, or requirements, so we will come back to these four points. Uh, so eligibility for funding is, uh, is uh, well, somehow a bit limited compared to uh, other programs, but it's uh, something expected. So it's uh, for EU member states, and these are in EU member states and uh, associated countries to horizon Europe. And also legal entities are in sub-Saharan countries are members of the EDCTP association. Uh, in exceptional circumstances, there may be funding available for, uh, for organizations in other countries, but the general rule is that, uh, so to be kept in mind. And uh, when it comes to composing uh, a consortium, the principle is that you need three different entities, three different organizations are in different countries. And, uh, and at least one entity has to be in an EU member state or an associated country. 
and at least one also in a, in a sub-Saharan country member of the DCTP association. So for the, the idea behind is that we foster collaboration between uh, EU and Africa and not only Africa alone or Europe alone. So this is why you, you have that. And th this applies generally across the board to, to all types of action, be it research or coordination support. This comes back all the time. Now, the scientific project leadership. Some of you may have heard that there is a new uh, element under this uh, joint undertaking. So the legislator decided uh, that uh, coordinators, I will summarize it, but coordinators can only be established in the EU associated countries or South Africa, because South Africa has a science and technology agreement with the EU. So this is the situation we, we are subject to, uh, but what was imagined to, to make sure that the African partners can still have the scientific leadership in the project and uh, have a very strong role in coordinating that, uh, that aspect of our project, uh, there is now a requirement when, to put it short, if the coordinator of your project is not in South Africa, you need to uh, basically assign a scientific project leader that is based in, an, uh, in a South African, uh, South Saharan African country, sorry. And uh, so this is the idea, to, to still keep leadership. So this uh, organization, organization has to work alongside the coordinator uh, for all scientific aspects to, to help assessing the quality of the deliverables, uh, checking those technical part of the reports, for example. Uh, another task that you will find in the, that we suggest in the, in the work program. And this should be then reflected in a specific work package. And, uh, and of course, all costs uh, included and, in, and uh, related to this, to this work as a scientific project are eligible, so like, uh, like others under the project. So, so this is really, yeah, this is our measure uh, at this point to, to ensure scientific leadership in Africa. And, uh, so this is a requirement in all, in all projects. Now, affordable access. So there, there is a specific uh, article in our funding regulation uh, that um, that uh, basically requires uh, that the products that are ultimately uh, developed on the basis of the research undertaken in the projects we fund uh, are um, later affordable, accessible for the public. And uh, this is a pretty broad requirement. And to implement it more specifically in our work program, uh, we have uh, additional conditions to some of the topics where relevant. Um, and so this means that there are additional deliverables and uh, exploitation obligations that come with this, uh, with this project. Uh, for example, a stewardship plan has to be drafted, a global access plan. Um, so yeah, this is something we can discuss more in detail, of course, uh, later on. But uh, yeah, this is also something to be taken into account. It's a, it's a novelty. Now, when it comes to uh, some financial aspects, and this is something related uh, mostly to the modal grant agreement that we will use uh, under EDCTP2, there was a specific modal agri uh, grant agreement uh, for that initiative. Uh, now we, in fact, have to use the same model agreement uh, as uh, all EU Horizon Europe programs uh, are, are using. And so this, this triggers a few changes. Um, in terms of eligibility of costs, generally there, are no, there is no revolution between Horizon Europe and uh, Horizon 2020. So this, like the, the main principles remain the same. Um, but there is now 5% uh, of the, the grant amount uh, at the beginning when you get the pre-financing, which is actually withdrawn from it, so this can be sometimes a surprise for some consortia when they are not aware of it. And this mutual interest mechanism is a way to, to cover uh, the funder, us, uh, from some risk. In fact, if there, there is any, uh, any recovery to do or if there are funds that are misused, which we hope uh, will be avoided, of course, uh, but this is a, a way to have a guarantee for us uh, so we, yeah, at the beginning you have this 5% that is set aside, it's something to be taken into account. Uh, in the past, it was possible to pay beneficiaries directly. So um, in principle, we have beneficiaries in uh, EU projects are paid via the coordinator. Uh, under EDCTP2, this was a bit different. Uh, now in this case, uh, this has disappeared. We, it's not part of this general model grant agreement, so we, we make all <coughs> payments to the coordinator who then uh, transfers to, to the beneficiaries. 
uh, the cost categories you find are yeah the, the usual ones you, you will have your your purchase costs you will have the indirect costs the personnel or others subcontracting and so on and also another novelty that's really a practical aspect is that now as we're passing under the EU uh, technical umbrella, so we're using the EU tools. Uh, this is true uh, internally for, for us, but also for you. So we, everything goes through the funding and tenders portal. Uh, it's quite centralized. That's where you register your organization. That's where you submit your proposal. That's where you find a lot of information, guidance, uh, reference documents. So I, I would really recommend in general that you, you do use this website, which is uh, overall quite uh, well done. Uh, there are also, of course, uh, help desks available when you have technical problems. Uh, but anyway, if you have questions, uh, do reach out to us and we will help you. Uh, and then... Yeah, to, to finish the, on this part, the financial statement, uh, the certificate on the financial statement is required for beneficiaries that receive uh, at least 430,000 of uh, EU funding. Um, so yeah, this is also to take into account, but it's nothing new. And now we'll uh, leave the floor again to Jean-Marie to tackle the topics. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so just to mention that we've been trying to build the portfolio of projects that come um, align very well with what is P2 has been funding in the past few years. You saw those bodies that advise us on the strategy. So based on the advice we've been receiving in the last few years when P 3 was being set up, uh, this what is displayed here comes from the work program 2023. This was the first implementation program, uh, the first year of implementation, the second year of implementation, uh, first being 2022. Some of you are holding grants that come from the first calls launched in 2022, and this is what we opened last May. Uh, the first few, the first five lines are single stage. The second, the, the two last are two stages. So those two, the, the vaccine call and the point of care diagnostics are still open and now being processed, but the other five are closed and evaluation is, uh, will be announced soon. Evaluation results will be announced soon to, to the applicants. Uh, but just to mention uh, that what we are used to, in terms of terminology, when you hear uh, us from p 2 talk about a call, each of these lines would be a call. Uh, but in p 3 uh, they, they are just, for example, now two calls. What is single stage goes in one call. So one line here is called a topic. That's, that, that's where myself, I had to familiarize with this, uh, the, the, this, this technology, based on how that system that Loha was presenting functions. If you open a, a number of topics, they are all put in one call. In this case, you just have to decide what is in the single. Uh, so whenever you are waiting for us to launch to open topics, uh, if, you see that, if you see an announcement, you'll have to be aware that it's not just one topic. Only when you open that tender portal, you'll see that it's a, one or two, three topics under that one specific call. Uh, so in terms of diversity, uh, as you'll see, I know some of you have been sending questions about fellowships. Fellowships is a great tradition of DCP1 and 2. So what we've been doing here in DCP3 is to come up with new models where we can support researchers and institutions to build the capacity. That very first line, Global Health DCP3 Training Networks, Clinical Research Fellowships, is the, only, the first topic which tackles that element. Uh, maybe this is what we'll be referring to in the future as the EDSTP3 training networks. As we, in the past, we got used to the term EDSTP networks of excellence. Here we are coming in an era where we talk about EDSTP3 training networks. These will be real projects as you are used to where there is research innovation, uh, but calling also fellows to apply to, 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 to be trained. This will be, ta will be targeting early to mid career researchers who get uh, invited to be part of consortia doing research. It's a good size of uh, money to, to, to train a number, of a number of fellows. Here I think we're aiming to have just three networks, maybe there'll be four, but you can much look at that funding uh, with an element of research. It, it will be a good size to start from as fellows, but we all have to see if we keep innovating new types of uh, fellows or if this becomes the main instrument to do uh, fellows. Then the second line was uh, a good understanding from EDCP3 was that EDCP2 went through uh, COVID-19 with a lot of projects that got affected financially, but also in terms of time to be implemented. So a lot of extensions, are, most of you were submitting no cost extensions to EDCP2. So some of those who were not actually, were given no cost extension, but needed also costed extension, were 
invited to apply to this call, which had a value of 14 million, where not, of course, it was impossible to cover everyone who needed to be covered. Uh, but here we'll be happy to support a few projects that were maybe the, 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 the most affected by that, uh, the COVID-19 crisis in terms of money. Now, there was a third call, we a topic we launched earlier this year, which was to tackle issues in, the, in this specific category, women and children. It was one of the, the largest topic in terms of funding, 26 million. This was also one of those that closed in August, being evaluated now. And then the fourth was on Ebola. As you recall, earlier this year, there was uh, a Sudan uh, strain outbreak in Uganda. So this was in that, in that context, not only for that, but because there was a need to, to do research on that strain, we opened a call which was actually not including vaccine, it was therapeutics, diagnostics, and social science on Ebola. It was also 11 million. A few projects will come from there. We are expect, we're expecting to have uh, two or three or four projects, I believe be around three, depending on the volume of uh, requested funding. Now, the good tradition of this P from this P1 is to support ethics and regulatory capacities. This year, too, there was an eight million topic which addressed that element. And I think this, if I recall, is one of the largest budget allocated in one single uh, work program to ethics and regulatory capacity projects. The other two, uh, which are now being evaluated, I'm sure some of you in the room are part of the, the, the panels, the committees that are evaluating that call. This is a call which will be a bit delayed because we opened these calls in May, but because of the summer coming when we, we, we were supposed to review, if you're expecting results from this call, uh, I believe earlier, later this year will be invited to submit, the, to go to the second stage. Those going to second stage will have the results somewhere later in uh, Q, Q1 or Q2 2024. Talk about the future. The work program 2024, um, all of us and those bodies you saw that advisors on the strategy have been busy trying to build a new set of topics that will come in 2024. It will be a bit higher in terms of budget compared to what I was displaying. Uh, so the, the <clears throat> this work program is currently in development. A few topics will be um, included, but it's also because we have already implemented the two work programs. We've been looking at what came out uh, of 22 and 23 to build a program that will help us diversify the portfolio, but also respond to the, to the, to, to the most urgent needs in terms of uh, disease areas that are not well covered by uh, the, 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 other, the other two first previ to the, the previously implemented work programs. Now, this will be published in Q1 2024, uh, but it's possible, if you're lucky, that it's done earlier. I cannot promise. We'll just put this indicative Q1 2024. Just to mention that what we did in April, um, uh, in April we did an info day just to inform everyone about the content of the topics that I was showing earlier. We are going to do the same uh, when we, we publish the topics for 2024. We are going to open an online info day where you, you'll be given the opportunity to ask questions in terms of uh, the content per call, but also logistics, eligibility issues that maybe are still new to you. In terms of collaboration, as we were mentioning, that this, this workshop is also about collaboration. Uh, you can collaborate with our Global Health JU in different ways as contributing partners, implementing a project, or just being part of um, a, a program, or just being part of an, an initiative without necessarily being a researcher. But for this, because it is both cross-cutting um, from science to finances to legal, I'll invite again my colleague, uh, Laurent. Okay, thank you. So yeah, contributing partners, so that's also something new. Um, so these are not uh, members of the Joint Energy King, but they are organization that uh, may be interesting to collaborate on usually a specific topic, a specific sector of research. And this can be, it's quite open. Uh, typically, you could have a philanthropy, you could have uh, the industry, you could have other countries, uh, you could have a research organization. And uh, the idea is that there is a common interest on a scientific topic and that these will, um, will basically either be involved in some projects and not be reimbursed, only partially. And in this case, they will provide some what we call in-kind contributions or they provide some financial contribution to the joint undertaking. And, uh, and this 
of course, gives them a say <coughs> on the topics uh, we will include in the work program. Uh, so, so like it's it's a question of having some some influence and uh, against a contribution. And this generally also the fact that we receive contributions from contributing partners uh, means that the GU can also use extra funds. So, like part of the budget that Jean-Marie was presenting you earlier is conditional to contributions we receive. So. To put it short, for one euro received from a contribution partner, we can spend also a euro. And uh, so, so, of course, this has an impact on the, the magnitude of the program. So as I said, financial or in kind, uh, that there are different ways to, to contribute. Um, to do so, a, an organization has to apply, and the governing board has to, to uh, accept this application. So. Of course, if your organization is interested, do reach out to us, please, first. We, we can discuss the, the scientific aspects, but also the, the legal and administrative ones. So, so yeah, what I mean is don't send the letter to the governing board without talking to us first, of course. Uh, this, will be, this will help you, probably. And now we're already at the Q&A session. So let's launch it. So let's try this again. Um, colleagues in the control room, can you show the questions that are incoming through the app? And if not, we'll just, you know. Yeah. OK, no, I can't read anything. You can go back to the presentation, thanks. And um, we will start getting questions from the audience. Can I get a show of hands? Great. Um, then can we go in the order from left to right to the microphone in the middle? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I don't know if the mic is working, yes? So it's about the fellowship program. So I understand it is uh, perceived or uh, designed as a research uh, project. So should we more emphasize the capacity building or the research aspects that the fellows would. Thank you. So uh, the, it's uh, with regards to the topic uh, uh, for the fellowships, uh, it's it's uh, very interesting. Uh, we try to apply for it, but what was unclear to us when we were writing our proposal whether we should more emphasize the, yeah, the the research to be done by that group of fellows, or should we more emphasize on the on training to be received by those fellows? especially considering that it would be scored as a research uh, project. Thank you. Thank you. The, because that work program had other topics to do research, um, that particular topic was really aiming to do training. So it's a, it's a balance that, that applicants had to make. But the most important element is that you have a pool of researchers who will come to be trained in that project, that consortium. So the, we, we, we're not giving max or minimum funding that has to be allocated to the fellowships section, but uh, it's important that there is research. There has to be a research innovation action, uh, but in the end, it was not meant to, it's not meant to, imp to implement a multi-million clinical trial, for example. It is meant to train by doing so. It's maybe a version of what in the past we had as integrated projects where you could have master's, PhDs training doing a clinical trial. But in this case, it was meant to go, um, to shift a bit, reduce what is allocated to the trial self, uh, but put more pressure, put more, more emphasis on, on the training. But we'll let, we'll let that uh, balance be made by those who are writing the proposals. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was part of a team that won a EDCP2 grant to do a study in Nigeria on resistance of malaria in pregnancy. We got some very good results. So I wanted to know, but we, it raised more questions that needed more studies. So I wanted to know what was the possibility of getting an additional fund to probably make the study larger because it was a molecular resistance. So we discovered some genes and now want to make the pool larger. So I was asking what opportunities are there. Can I resubmit the grant or? Okay, thank you. I will, uh, I will address that one quickly. The, uh, the way we operate, as we were mentioning, 
we do open calls for proposals every year. So it's through competition that you can apply, reapply <clears throat> to, to EDTP3. We are not going specifically to target all the projects to be resupported, but you are welcome to apply to calls, to topics that are in line with your, with your research. That could be next year or maybe uh, in two years, but we're not, we're not specific on that one this year. Okay, th thank you very much uh, to all the <coughs> presenters for the excellent job. My name is Yaoba Seydou. I work for the Clinton Health Access Initiative. I also have some background in uh, experience in industry, academia, research, and so on. So just two questions. I think the first one is there are some emerging concepts in global health, like um, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, gender, and also things like digital health. How well are these? Uh, and also another important concept is uh, informativeness of clinical trials. How well are these concepts uh, articulated in the new program and what mechanisms, uh, so structures and systems do you have in place to ensure that these uh, concepts are reflected in the, in the protocols or in the budgets you fund? So the second question is, I have seen the budget of EDC, the, the budget that you just projected about 1.6 billion, which is really insufficient to address the, uh, the, 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 the research needs of, uh, of, of, of the participating countries. So the one question I, ha I wanted to ask is, how do you really ensure that uh, the, the EDCTP Association, particularly the partner, partner countries, meet their commitments of timely disbursements of funds? Because we in the development world, we know a mechanism of how to go about that, and we know it's a really, really big challenge. So if you don't have, if you don't uh, know the right pathway, it becomes very difficult to get partner contribute, uh, con uh, countries to meet their contributions. And then another important concept is how do you find synergies with other organizations? Because there are a lot of startups that are interested in funding initiatives, uh, particular innovations uh, in the continent. And is there any marketing plan or business development that you plan to implement that can actually expand on the uh, funding bucket that you have? Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of questions in one. <clears throat> <clears throat> I will try to, to just to, to make it short. But uh, the, the first element, the concepts that are emerging, I think what you are referring to as emerging concepts, we saw that a few years ago that they were going to emerge. So they are already embedded in our strategy, issues related to gender equity. They are there if you read the core topic, well described, and part of the evaluation when our experts are, compare, are assessing the proposals, they do look at what which proposal is best addressing, for example, equity issues, and then uh, those those are the elements that we maybe started working on probably ten years ago, but maybe now they are in the mainstream media as being discussed uh, or be, maybe being missed by some funders. But I think I'm happy or proud to say that we picked that early. Uh, related to the, to, to, to the financing, uh, marketing, or strategy, we do have those kinds that you see as members of the association. The association is growing. A few years ago, it was just maybe 15 members. Now it's 27 members from Sub-Saharan Africa, which are part of the association. And they have an equal vote with the European Union, which is the co-founder of the joint undertaking. Uh, so what is, uh, for sure, uh, there is that budget which comes, that funding which comes from the commission. Uh, and to be, then on top of that, we'll have contribution from member states. But an element where we are developing what you are referring to as a marketing strategy is how to get more contributing partners, the industry, the philanthropies, who maybe sometimes work in a silo or with, up, with other partners to see if they can join us and contribute to this program. That's why I was mentioning that the 1.6 billion, I hope or I believe that will be much more. Thank you. There are also uh, practically uh, conditions for participation of beneficiaries at the operational level, not only the strategic level that Jean-Marie has mentioned. So the beneficiaries should also, as a condition of, of admissibility of the project, submit a gender equality plan. Uh, there are also conditions that are included, uh, and the project should reflect them and respect them in the grant agreement, again, regarding uh, gender equality and the other old principles that, uh, that you have mentioned. So it's not only at the strategic level of the decision making of the framework of the JG, but also operationally at the level of the project, the level of the beneficiaries. But what about informativeness? For, for, I'm sorry? Informativeness. informativeness of clinical trust, to ensure that clinical trust actually end in, in an informative manner. 
that are that it show that it show uh, that it shows the, the the results you mean yeah shows the results that are yes. relevant for policy because we know a lot of tri trials end up on informatively again there are three main reports that are part of the obligatory deliverables of the projects that involve clinical trials that should respect this principle and give this as as much as possible respect the transparency and openness uh, principle again at the operational level uh, Jean-Marie. Yes, uh, please do. Thanks, thanks for your presentation. Uh, can you throw a little bit of light on this issue of coordination and the uh, fact that uh, it's only South Africa that has that role? There is a bit of confusion in the minds of many people. Uh, something that uh, Ghana and Senegal and Mali and Belgium cannot come together to uh, submit a proposal. Uh, that by all means there must be a South African partner. Can you throw a bit of light on this? Yeah, I'll uh, say a few words on this. So the, uh, there's what is referred to in the presence of LoRa as the Science and Technology Agreement, uh, which is signed between South Africa and the European Union. Th that's a legal thing which uh, existed before this P3 was set up. And when this P3 was set up, uh, somewhere it was imagined for the interest of in the, in the interest of uh, financial protection, uh, funding coming from the European Union, that, there has, that, that has to be in place for a country to connect if you are outside what is referred to as member states or associated countries. Uh, I don't know how much work, or how long it takes for a country to sign such an agreement, but I can imagine that if you want to submit a proposal next year, it may be too short for your country to get that agreement in place. Uh, so we are moving ahead with South Africa being the only sub-Saharan African country being able to coordinate. But then again, uh, for everyone to know, the coordinator, as we know we know them in the past, they were doing both science and, and finance coordination. But in the context of the joint undertaking, coordination is really that financial aspect. The, the, the scientific coordination of the project, which was actually the work of the PI's institution, is what we are shifting in, in, into the hands of the scientific project leader. Uh, hopefully, as we grow further, this term scientific project leader will be much more prominent at, and signify, signify what a project coordinator was meaning to you researchers. Uh, I'm not sure if some countries are making steps to have that agreement in place. It will be good because we don't know what will, be, what will happen after, the, after Horizon Europe. There may be another prog a successor program which falls under a different framework. If that instrument still has to be used, maybe countries, it will be up to countries to decide whether they want to go that route. But uh, for now, um, our role in the finance team, legal team, operation team, will try to see if this scientific process leader gets prominence, but also understood what we have we've not yet achieved is to make sure in the, in the portal that is used, the IT tools, it, it still refers to coordinator versus beneficiaries but that new term is not yet embedded in the, in the larger um, system that is used by applicants. So of necessity, there must be a South African coordinator. No, uh, so that's maybe that what I missed in my response. You, to be a coordinator, you have to be a, a member of the European Union or associated country, in a, one of those associated countries which were mentioned. And if, if for example, you don't have uh, a if you don't have a connector from Europe, you are, you are a consortium of maybe Belgium, Senegal, and Ghana, and your colleague in Belgium says, I'm not ready to coordinate, then you really have to look for a South African. Or if you, there's no other French or Swedish who's ready to coordinate, then in that case, you are left with looking for South, uh, for South Africa. Maybe, um, yeah. I, I just, Julia? Just give me a second. I want to check if Michael wanted to add something to this. Well, thank you very much for the interventions. I just wanted to say that uh, there might be a lot of worry that um, going forward, uh, different African institutions will be disadvantaged when it comes to the funds that they receive as part of the response to the program. That's not the case. Uh, it is the model of, when we talk of financial coordination, it is the distribution of the funds. 
but the allocation of the budgets to the institutions remain the same. And the distribution of the funds has the element of the linkage to the um, security of the money, and that's why the 5% is held back uh, to ensure that there is that cover. And that only applies to, at the moment, countries that have the science and technology agreement. But the money that goes to the institutions will remain the same. Uh, it is the distribution of the funds. When the, for example, the pre-financing goes to an institution, the institution that distributes the money to the others that are part of the consortium. So the concept <laughs> remains basically the same. The scientific coordination remains the same, but it's just that little construct, the administrative construct of distribution of the funds. That's what um, at the moment has changed. And measures will also be put in place to help in future uh, where there are uh, difficulties of this nature to see that we get other models that may help um, really alleviate the constraint, especially where some consortia find difficulty in getting uh, financial coordinators. I don't know whether that helps. Yes, thanks, Michael. Okay. Um, we're just going to go with a couple of questions online so that they don't feel like we're ignoring them. Um, so the first question comes from Stephanie Sawinski. Is there a template for the application as a contributing partner? Laurent, Jean-Marie? Well, not yet. Uh, thanks if Steph is online. Steph is a former colleague who has left, but uh, I'm happy to hear that she's following us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, probably that, that template, she thought it's already in place, but we are working on it very soon to be available and uh, easy to be shared. If I could just add practically, this doesn't prevent uh, potential contributing from applying. We already have one, in fact. So if you're interested, reach out and we will, even though we don't have a template ready yet, we can very much uh, guide you in telling you what you need to include in your, uh, in your request and applications. Thank you both. Um, there's a couple of questions on fellowships, so I'm going to try to um, put them together. Um, uh, the, so for the training networks, first question is, will these cover undergraduate studies? So the, the, the one which is closed is really closed, uh, but there will be future fellowships. What the, <laughs> the, the training networks, it was specified that is targeting early to mid-career. Uh, now that definition can vary from the, the, the field of research, depending on what that specific research innovation action is doing, there could be maybe undergraduates who will be supported in that program. Uh, so it's really not very specific saying that it has to be postgraduate. It is covering all the elements that are maybe in the research team have to be addressed, de depending if there is an early career who's been doing research there in the project, but is an undergrad. We did not say it's excluded. But if a proposal has, has given us um, convincing reasoning that undergrads can be trained in that project, uh, it won't be seen as ineligible. But the aim target of the course is early, early to mid-career researchers uh, with the prospect of, of remaining in, in, in research. But future, future calls, we cannot say how they will look like, but to try to diversify the fellowships category, building on what we've learned from the previous programs, what worked, what didn't work. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Um, another question that just came in, um, quite relevant, it says, for those in developing countries who have no connection with European colleagues in terms of research collaboration, what do we need to do to get in touch with other European partners to prepare and submit a joint grant? That's a great question because it, this question was asked like 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and what I've discovered is that while some uh, funding agencies try to build pages where you can search partner and encourage people to work with you, these tools are not very well used. What we have in that portal that we're displaying where you, you register to be a reviewer to apply, there's a little sentence, a, a little section of the website which maybe we'll try to promote more when we do workshops, when we announce, when we do the info days, where you can search for a partner. And partners can also register there. So if you are maybe submitting a proposal on Ebola, for instance, and you're looking for a researcher on diagnostics on Ebola within Europe, 
you can go maybe use a few search terms, key keywords, and see who are your potential partners. It is something which is probably underused by ourselves in terms of promoting that tool, but I guess it can be useful for the few of you who may be struggling with getting a partner from you. Thank you very much. Let's go back to questions from the audience. I see a hand up. Thank you very much. Uh, Margaret Japon, University of Health and Allied Sciences in Ghana. Um, for EDCTP2, I was pleased to see that you introduced implementation research and phase four. I see it's appearing again in EDCTP3. When it comes to your fellowships, I see you have clinical research fellowships. At what point are you planning to add implementation research fellowships? Thank you. Good question. I think I'll give the microphone to Michael for, for now. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thank you, Margaret, for asking that question. Uh, actually, we have a very interesting session on Friday. But here, the research aspect covers what is within the scope of the program. And here you will have um, all phases uh, of clinical development, including product-focused implementation research. So this is part and parcel of, of it. They are not, implementation research in this case is not excluded. Yes. Thanks, Michael. Was there any other hand? Yeah, that's right. Good morning, Maria Luisa from ICGB, and thank you uh, for, for the interesting presentation. I'm, uh, what I'm wondering is, I couldn't see also in the work program uh, for 2024, actually any mention to international organizations. So I was wondering if they are including among <coughs> the uh, contributing partners, and also if in future, is foreseen to open some exception for or international organization in order to enable them to, um, let's say, participate to the call, especially for those who has, let's say, the vast majorities of their parties belonging either to the ADCTP association or European countries. I'm saying this because as I heard, there are for example, struggling in finding partners, or for example, in some calls that are more cross-cutting and multilateral, there might be a plus added value from international organization. I know you're gonna tell me that are eligible for funding, but actually in reality, what is happening is that they may, I mean, we, we don't <laughs> at the end, because we're asked to contribute or to, to, to contribute really financially, and especially those who are small, they cannot afford it. Well, I, maybe as it happens under Horizon, some of the call might see an added value in enabling their participation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe just to put this question in context, there are categories that we have, uh, the way we classify organizations. If you are a university, you are an institution body, educa education body, if you are maybe NCD pastor, you are a research organization. But there's a category of entities that we, in Horizon 2020, Horizon Europe, refer to and as international organization. For example, the Institute of Vac the, the, the Institute, International Institute, Vaccine Institute would be an international organization, or ECAGB that uh, our colleague is mentioning. So that category of international organizations legally, they are not eligible to receive funding. You cannot uh, somehow, <coughs> there's this list which is established. If you register as a new entity, you, you go to the office of your country, register, and you say you are an international organization, uh, and then for us, you've put a trap for yourself because it won't be easy to, for you to get funding. So that question has been coming a lot. And the quick answer, as you were saying, we, we were telling you to maybe join other consortia where you won't be funding, but you'll gain from the the, the funding to the other members of the consortium, but of course that's not what you need. I don't have really a quick answer to this question. Maybe if my legal colleagues can 
come forward and mention if there is any room for, for, for innovation in this. this area. Yes, no, so the, the options are a bit scarce, I have to say, but uh, it's just like any ineligible uh, partner to a project in exceptional circumstances. It may be decided, as you know, that they are essential and uh, in that case they could receive funding. It's not even automatic. Uh, but uh, but I, I think, yeah, we should rather think about that for the future. It may be that some, uh, some topics will actually require participation of international organizations, in which case maybe we could uh, identify some even and uh, make them eligible in specific cases, but here I'm, uh, I'm speculating. I, I think it's a, it's a question for the future potentially, but I'm afraid that in general, yes, uh, they have to come with their own funding. Uh, I just want to add that uh, it can also be, uh, you can also collaborate in within the consortium as a subcontractor. So in a way, you're, if, if you will have that, capacity as a subcontractor that you will still get the money. So that's a way of getting funding in a way. The other hand. Yeah. Um, good morning. Thank you for the kind presentation. Uh, Ardi Foots, IAVI, the Netherlands. My question is around the um, joint calls with collaborating partners um, or associated partners, not sure what's the right term here, but um, what will be the mechanism for launching those calls? Will that also be part of the publication in Q1 for the calls for 2024, or will those be launched uh, whenever they are being agreed upon with the new partners coming on board? Thank you. Thanks, Ardi. Uh, so the, the, the Whatever will be in 2024, including a contributing partner, uh, that's almost already decided. There have been partners that came forward and indicated that they want to collaborate <laughs> with a contribution for 2024. Such so a work in the making, uh, those will be announced soon. But that does not exclude IAVI, for example, coming forward and uh, telling us that they'd like to collaborate. Then we can imagine a topic in 2025, for example, or uh, legally it's possible to amend what will be published in Q1. If there is strong uh, con convincing reasons to, to amend that work program, if there is good contribution to come. So we refer to them as contributing partners, and they come forward on basically discussions that go, go on a continuous basis between us and different organizations, but also looking at areas that would not, that are still, are still gaps to be addressed by us. So if, uh, if maybe we've opened a large call on, on malaria vaccines, and uh, Oxford University comes with a good envelope and says that they'd like to be contributing partners, that can be a reason, for example, to amend that, uh, that, that, that topic and include new contributing partners. And here I have to mention that those ca categories that Loha was presenting where you are a partner co-implementing the project, there are also partners who do not co-implement. They just bring the, the money in the pot and the constable implementing the project. But where that first category you co-implement you have to be really involved in co-writing the project as well. Any other hand? I think close to completion. Okay. No online question. No. Maybe we'll just take one from uh, from the, the last hand. Thank you. I'm Ole Bagsit from uh, MME in Switzerland. Uh, in your slide, when you presented the work program for 24, you said it's currently under development. Um, and the input is for the governing board, the committee, and the stakeholder groups. And then it said others. And I'm just wondering if there is any opportunity to engage, to, to provide input under the, the current development of the work program. Thanks for that question. I think we had the last week a question of whether we open these drafts to the public to comment. We do not do that. So the, it's under development when we mention the others who are maybe contribute to that is because there are these contributing partners in the pipeline who are co-developing maybe call text or contributing to the call text which are being developed. But it won't be open to, to the public or to others, meaning you, the large pool of potential recipients of the funding. Uh, you will see... Uh, maybe we'll publish a draft which will say it's, this is uh, the draft pending governing board approval, but th there won't be many changes after that the document has been uh, on the website. Uh, 
Okay, thank you for that. And then a, a final very practical question about the gender equity plan, which is a requirement for all partners to, to be able to participate in consortia. Does that apply to all, everybody who, who is a partner in consortia, independent of the status of the institution? Uh, no, no, not, not, to, not to everyone, only uh, to associate countries and, and EU members. EU members and associated countries to Horizon Europe. Thank you. I guess we've come to an end, and thank you for the participation coming so early. If you have other questions, there was an email for, que for, 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 for questions, but we're also opening via our website announcing workshops and info days when the, the new work program is up. Thank you. Thank you.